Welcome to another episode of In the Lab with Hoopsology. I am the big bearded man in the middle. Matt Thomas joined as always by the point guard of this podcast and one of my best friends, Justin Goodrum. Justin, how you doing, man? Doing really well, man. Day after Halloween, it's November. Weather is colder. Got hit with a freak snowstorm <laughs> in Denver. Um, how about yourself? Oh, man. No such luck with the snow here. Maybe that's a good thing for right now. Thankfully, no wind either. Nice Halloween. It was pretty cold here as well. Speaking of Halloween, I was scrolling on X or Twitter, whatever we're calling it, <laughs> and did notice a lot of NBA player costumes, too, that uh, really stood out to me. Wanted to get your thoughts. Did you have any NBA costumes that you saw that that jumped out to you? Um, not much. I know the TNT guys did Halloween. Um, I saw with Victor Wimbenyama. I thought his costume was cool. Pretty simple, but frightening with the Slender Man. Um, yeah. And then LeBron, I forgot what he was, but he always loves Halloween. He always is known for his Halloween parties. So Isn't he uh, Freddy Krueger? I I think so. I forgot. Well, maybe I, I that was from a past year. Um, on he his- was definitely Freddy Krueger at least once. Yeah, I loved Victor Wemby- Wembenyama's Slender Man. I also really enjoyed DeAndre Jordan's Taylor Swift. I don't know if you oh, saw, yeah, that. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure funny is. from, uh, <laughs> you know, one yeah. of your um, your hometown Nuggets players there. <laughs> so we have a lot to discuss today. So we're gonna we're gonna get into it. We we've got some early season impressions, how teams are performing, what went according to plan, what has uh, been different maybe than what we had predicted just recently in our season predictions. But man, we had some big news come down the pipe. Uh, just yesterday, really just Halloween morning, um, James Harden is traded. He is now a Los Angeles Clipper. You probably saw, but just in case you didn't, the Clippers receive James Harden, P.J. Tucker, and Philippe Petrusev. Please forgive me if I mispronounced. And then the 76ers get Nick Batum, Robert Covington, Marcus Morris, K.J. Martin, a first-round pick from the Thunder, Two first round picks from the Clippers and uh, a 2028 first round pick from the Clippers as well. So the 76ers make out pretty well in terms of getting a lot of expiring deals, a lot of first round picks. The buzz around this trade was that a lot of people, especially Bill Simmons, I know, was harping on the Clippers because it, it didn't seem like there were a lot of teams pressuring the 76ers and and just blowing down the doors to try to get him and add the, him to their roster. Although I did see a rumor that the bulls were a potential suitor for Saw a that. second there, Justin. So yeah. I was thinking of you, of course, I want to break this down from, from both sides of the trade, Justin, and just get your initial reactions. Obviously we have to see how this plays out, but let's just, let's just go right into it. And uh, let's go from the Clippers side. How do you feel about them acquiring James Harden? And then, of course, P.J. Tucker, no small piece either. How are you feeling about this? Are you, are you positive on this, negative, or or otherwise? For sure. Um, I will answer your question. I have some breaking news. Minor breaking news, but breaking news regarding this trade. Mm. Um, this took place an hour ago from Woj. Um, They're actually trading the Clippers, uh, Philippe Petrusev, and Cash to the Kings. Oh wow! Um, and then the Kings will be able to evaluate him and see if he has a future there. That's from Wojnowski, and that was <laughs> from an hour ago. By the time you're listening to this podcast, um, you'll get news of that. But just wanted to um, put that out there before we went any further. Yeah. Um, regarding your question, I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of sick of the Clippers, to be honest. <laughs> I <laughs> you and me both. I'm like, whatever. I'm just I'm sick of James Harden and Russell Westbrook. I'm sick of Paul George. I'm sick of Kawhi Leonard. I think on paper, if, if like you show this to a casual basketball fan, you're like, how can I not win the championship? But we have <laughs> seen this team just be inconsistent over and over and over again. I just – injuries, chemistry issues. I just don't see this ending in a positive direction. So I'm, I'm whatever. It's a, it's a situation where I'm going to have to see it in terms of consistency of this team rising to the top of the Western conference. And I do think that the regular season for some minor exceptions, Miami and 
the Lakers. That regular season performance matters with this team. They're going to have to prove it on a consistent basis. So, you know, like with any trade, you got to give it a couple of months for these guys to mold with each other. But I would say by MLK Day, if the Clippers are not within the top five of the Western Conference, I would deem this as a pretty much a failure and their expectations being pretty low heading into the playoffs. Yeah, and they have started hot to their credit. I think they're three and one as of recording this podcast. Um, so they are starting off with a bang. I I am feeling, you know, kind of nervous about picking them such a low seed. And I do think this is what James Harden brings to the table is more solidity in that regular season record. I can't really stand by my prediction of the Clippers as 10th place in the Western Conference after this. Uh, but we'll see what happens. You know, there's there's a chance chemistry gets messed up here as it has been messed up at James Harden's last three stops, which, by the way, four stops in the last three years. Um, it, it's a lot of stops. You know, people know what I've said about James Harden, I don't want him on my team. I don't care if he still puts up stats. Me either. No. This doesn't do anything for me in terms of raising the Clippers title ceiling. But like I said, I think you're raising the ceiling of their regular season win loss. At the end of the day, though, this is not 2019 Kawhi Leonard. This is not 2020 even Paul George. Um, so I, I have my doubts. And really, all those guys need to be healthy for them to even have a shot. If the Clippers are playing the Nuggets right now in a playoff series, everybody healthy and in it, I'm still not picking the Clippers to beat the Denver Nuggets. Maybe it does give them more of a chance in the postseason, but we haven't seen that that would be that would be an outlier on James Harden's resume and not the typical trend with it. But you have to look at this, I think, from an organizational perspective as well. And they already arguably gave up too much for Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. They already kind of put almost all their chips in. So this is kind of like, you know, this is the last hand of the night in this poker game here. They already have almost all their chips in. So they're, they're just being kind of forced all in is what this feels like. And I think part of that is coming from the pressure of the new arena and things like that. Um, even though I, I think smart team building trumps everything. It seems like Balmer wants the flashy names on the roster. So that's, that's what happened here. No, I completely agree. And I think we've seen in recent NBA history that just because you put together a bunch of superstars doesn't mean they're going to win. And that even goes for the Miami Heat. Um, when LeBron got there, their first year, they did not win the title. It came close, but they didn't win it. And so it, it took chemistry to get everybody to play cohesively. And I think if you don't have that, we've seen where there's catastrophic failures. Um, I'll toss this question to you, Matt, real quick. With James Harden, I get the sense that he, I don't know, what do you think his reputation is within the, the league? Because I kind of compare him to Carmelo a little bit or even Allen Iverson. It seems like they got more of a bad rap than James Harden. Is this the fact that James Harden could be labeled as a better player than both of those guys? And that's why he gets a little bit of a pass. It just seems like he doesn't get the venom and vitriol compared to those two guys just based on their team hopping. You know, I'd say honestly, of course, being very outside of him personally, it seems to me that he is – much more soft spoken than the other two that you mentioned, Carmelo, Makes even, sense. even though I don't think Carmelo was out as outspoken as Allen Iverson. I think that's a big reason that we see maybe a little less vitriol towards him. I think the media is kind of kind of all in and maybe even almost to the point of being excessive about it, um, about calling James Harden a quitter and things like that. And, you know, I'm I'm certainly not a James Harden fan. It's it's well known, but um, the the guy is talented. It's just a question of of heart and drive, I think, which is one of the big reasons. And you can you can talk about all kinds of circumstances. You know, the Chris Paul injury in 2018, like things like that. Yes, there have been some things like that, but again, four teams in three years and the majority of these situations being situations that he pushed his way into himself. So it's, it's hard to have sympathy there, but you're right. I, I think in some respects, there's still kind of like this 
uh, maybe distraction from the big stats and numbers, maybe the fact that he won a league MVP award. Um, but I, I think James Harden has proven himself by his own actions and play to be a depreciating asset. And that's why both you and I are not comp- confident in the Clippers title chances. No, completely agree with you. So moving on to the other side of this trade, and we don't have to take too long here because there are going to be other dominoes that fall here. I just want to ask you point blank. I mean, we've seen the number thrown around like friend of the show, Keith Smith was talking a lot about um, the 76ers assets and, and things like that. Uh, we have 50 to $65 million, depending on how things break out of cap space opened up for the 76ers next year if they do nothing right now, just based on expiring contracts, things like that. It seems with these first round picks, if they're looking to try and ensure that Joel Embiid doesn't become a New York Nick or something else other than a 76er, they're probably going to act before this trade deadline, I I think is uh, not a hot take at all. But just looking at this trade and maybe the potential of what this, this could become, yeah, it's an incomplete score, but how do you feel about what Daryl Morey landed here for this 76ers. I mean, would it, would it be better potentially if he had waited to pull the trigger on this deal? Um, I think he needed to move James Harden. I just think he was such a, and now I know I've heard different things in terms of, Oh, he handled it great. But like you said, man, I mean, how many teams has this dude been on in the last four years? (laughs) And just, yeah, it wasn't like he was saying great things about Daryl Morey. I mean, it was pretty toxic. And then that spreads to the rest of your locker room where your players have to answer questions every single day about that. So to me, just getting rid of them and then moving and turning the page, I think it's just the, the, the best solution to the situation. Now, the players that they acquired, what Woj said, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, is that they want to turn um, those players into trade assets. And like you said, Matt, try to appease Joel Embiid but I'm just wondering who's available, like out in the trading block, to get. I mean, and it was what is going to really appease him. I just, I don't know. Have you heard anything in terms of yeah. what Philly can do, and <laughs> in terms of flipping this? And yeah. I, I'm not very optimistic. And to me, Embiid's a player that he wants to win. I mean, he'll say the right things, but we know what this guy wants. He wants to be, I think, a legend. He wants to win championships. And currently, if they don't get it done, the Sixers. He's going to want to trade. I think we're, we're going to see a trade request if they don't appease him, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. We have to see how this unfolds. I, you know, I tend to trust Daryl Morey as a GM in spite of his his infatuation with James Harden, which you have to imagine the door is shut on that now after what has been said uh, at him from James Harden. But he was able to flip decent value for Ben Simmons. He got James Harden in for Ben Simmons. Um, and then he, he flipped this around for assets that, you know, we have to see what the pieces become. He's, he's kind of been a halfway decent, if not very competent chess master over the years. So I, I do still have faith in him as a, a GM um, names that I've heard, like uh, again, friend of the show, Casey Kiernan of AM hoops was saying, he would like to see Maxi and and Embiid be the star players of this team and kind of go like the 2020 Lakers route, try to just use these first round picks and add some depth or, uh, over an already fairly deep roster in terms of mid-level pieces that, that can all contribute to a deep bench. So he was suggesting your guy, Alex Caruso, maybe they can, they can wedge him from the Bulls if the Bulls are looking to get off of his salary cap hit um he was suggesting that maybe it's been rumored buddy healed could bring in some shooting to that team so maybe again a, another thing where one or two first round picks can bring in one or, or both of those players um you know a big name that's out there like higher tier players that are out there to answer your question from earlier zach levine again from the bulls uh i don't know if you want to bring in if you trust him in that's Philadelphia. A terrible Terrible yeah. mistake. <laughs> yeah, I definitely know how you feel about Zach Levine. Um, yeah. But, you know, maybe you want to get some assets, fleece the Sixers for some assets from sure. him. Um, 
and the other name that's that was out there, you know, the sexiest name in the NBA trade deadline, <laughs> OG Ananobi. Yeah. Uh, if they compiled a lot of assets together, maybe they could get him. It seemed like his trade value was through the roof. So good luck there. But um, yeah, I, I think the nice thing is they they can still wait. I think they're going to get a lot of wins as long as Joel Embiid stays healthy. The other thing that's nice on an individual level for Joel Embiid, if he's willing to put in the work and grind this season, you have now an even wider MVP lane that has opened up for him. Because now you can you can say if, if you're like a top three seed in the East, hey, I lost my my star player, my co all star player. And I was still able to get us to a top three seed in the East. So it can be a profile raising year for Embiid if he wants it. No, it's a fair point. Lots of things going on with that. We will see how that unfolds. Give us your guys' thoughts on the James Harden trade. I mean, who won this trade? In my book, you guys already can probably tell. I think the 76ers won this trade. It may be addition by subtraction. You could even argue getting James Harden off the roster. Maybe that's a step too far. Let us know your thoughts. I want to go through real quick with our team updates here, Justin. And uh, as the listeners well know, I'm a Rockets fan, Bulls fan through and through. And I just want to give some thoughts about these opening games. I think I have a little bit less to say about the Rockets than you do about the Bulls. So I'll just go ahead and jump in. The Rockets are one of the remaining winless teams at the time of recording this episode. We're 0-3. Good news is the contest against the Spurs and even the Warriors up until the end were closely contested games. That's a lot more than I can say compared to what we saw from the Rockets last season a lot of the times. Now, yes, it makes me a little bit nervous already about a 35-win prediction that uh, I placed on them, but we know this is a team that's going to grow a lot in the second half of the season. Things that I like, Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks. Yes, Dylan Brooks have been great fits on this team. And uh, Dylan Brooks, I mean... His perimeter defense has been great. His shooting even has been great at this point. That could certainly change. But it seems like the Fred Van Vliet, Shangun pick and roll action too has been a handy thing or even pick and pop. Those guys are able to create together. As Roosh Williams predicted on our show, I mean, Fred Van Vliet is doing a pretty good job taking care of the ball. But with the younger guys on this team, turnovers are still a big issue. Amen Thompson has a ways to go to develop as a competent leading point guard. But he's shown some flashes of brilliance. And you can see the athleticism and the potential there. Uh, I love that Coach Udoka has such confidence in Alper and Shangun, who I think is right now the most talented guy on this team. So I love that they are seeing what they have in him and running a lot of the offense through Shangun. If it's not going through Fred Van Vliet, it's usually going through Alper and Shangun. So I, I'm all for it. Let's see what we have. This is year three. Let's figure out with a lot of these guys, with Jalen Green as well. Let's figure out what we have here and if this is a long-term asset that we're able to keep. Um, I think that's about all I have so I'm not panicked that the Rockets are 0 3. It's not terribly unexpected. You know, we'll see how they go uh, through the first 20 games of the season, really. And if if it's super bad through 20, then you know there's nothing we can do. This is a developing team, but I'll I'll be a little bit more worried at that point. Justin, your thoughts on on the Bulls, man, or anything else? Yeah, um, I'm envious, and I never thought I'd be envious of a team that's been winless so far this season, but I am. (laughs) (laughs) At least you have younger players, you're optimistic towards the future. I am not with this Bulls team. Um, Mm. I don't know if you saw, they are 2-2. and Um, Julia Poe of the Chicago Tribune said on her one of her tweets, following their first loss of the season against the Thunder, that the Bulls had a players-only meeting. (laughs) <laughs> so basically, Billy Donovan walked into the Bulls locker room, and the players were already in heated conversations. He asked if they wanted him to leave and handle the conflict. The players said yes, so he did. <laughs> Donovan emphasized that embracing conflict is the key for this year's roster. Um, game one. Wow. Yeah, game one. And then I see them play the Raptors in a complete disaster. 
DeMar DeRozan, I think, misses a free throw in the fourth quarter. Don't quote me on that. I think to win the game or to at least tie it. But then the Raptors turn it over, and I think they're able to, I think, send it to overtime. And then I think the Bulls won it overtime barely just due to Raptors' incompetence. I mean, this is, I think, oh, man, how do I say this? I would say this is kind of like in the top three of like the worst positions to be in in sports where you have a talented team, but you know the team is not going to be any good in terms of progressing into the playoffs or their future. This kind of reminds me a little bit of the Bulls back when it had Ben Gordon, when it had Kirk Heinrich, when it had Andres Nocioni. Good players, not great. Um, but at least with those guys besides Ben Gordon, I mean, these guys weren't like perennial all-stars. Uh, I think Ben Gordon made an all-star team once. I, mean, I don't remember. I think you're um, right. But I, I think what sucks is that I like DeMar DeRozan, and Zach Levine shows signs of greatness. So you have Vucevic, who's been an all-star in Orlando. On paper, again, you know this team should be performing a lot better, but we've seen it, especially with Lonzo Ball out. This team needs to be blown up. I just feel like it's over. Just <laughs> start from scratch. The Bulls are going to be terrible. Just trade everybody. That, that includes Tamar, who has been fantastic. But the way this team's constructed, I just don't see the point. We're just delaying the inevitable right now. So that's it. That's just going to be my thoughts throughout the season unless something changes. So. Yeah. Do you get the sense from anything you, you've seen that it is going to be a fire sale at some point, that they are going to move off of those players? Do you think it's just kind of inevitable? I've heard rumors, and going back to our James Harden point, I've seen some articles where – Damar and Zach Levine happy to mention. And I think, honestly, I'd be happy for Damar DeRozan to end up on a team like the Sixers where he, I think he'd be unselfish and he'd be, be like the third option and hitting that mid-range jumper. I think that wouldn't be a problem. But, you know, my thoughts on Zach Levine, he's a, what's it called, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like, people mm. think he's a, he has everything you want in an elite player, but just his stats and his performance doesn't resemble that, in my opinion. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I feel I feel bad for you, man. It, it's nah. a tough spot that they're in, <laughs> yeah. and then you're gonna have to go through and shift gears. And unless, I mean, unless they can get tremendous value or, or something really turns around that's unexpected, it does seem like you're gonna have to go through that that rebuild yeah. gear shift. Oh, yeah. And um, and it seems like the Bulls franchise is one of those franchises that gets you know, kind of quick fingers. And then all of a sudden, Oh, let's hit, let's hit the trade deal again. Like when you're heading into that rebuild and, and then you get kind of back into, you know, this eight to 12 seed range that, you know, just kind of slows the inevitable as you were saying. Yeah. Well, the rebuild works. I mean, look what yeah. happened with Derek Rose with, um, Joe Kim Noah. Yeah. And I'm blanking on who else did they have? I thought Taj was- Gibson. There you go. Oh man. A great yeah. team. And yeah. Jimmy Butler. I mean, yeah, Jimmy Butler, he, those are all draft picks. And so to me, I'm much more of a proponent of drafting as opposed to just put a collection of like some makeshift all stars and hoping it works. So, yeah, I'm with you. And uh got to say, also, you make my heart happy just hearing the name Kirk Heinrich. I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> right. I used to love me some Kirk me Heinrich, too. especially later in his career when he would yeah. wear like the goggles oh, yeah. and very yeah. crafty player, you know, just kind of one of those smart guys that stayed in the league. Uh, for a long time. So Rockets and Bulls, you know, it's it's a little bit of of the toilet bowl, maybe. We'll have to see when they, <laughs> they play each other and uh see what happens there. Yeah, <laughs> could true. could be some rough basketball. We'll see. Uh so for the rest of the show, Justin, just real quick, I, I wanted to go through, you know, just some unexpected things could be good, could be bad that we've seen from our first official week of the regular season of the NBA. Since uh, yesterday, actually, at the time of recording this podcast, it's been one full week of the regular season. There, there's been, you know, to the league's credit, I think a lot of good games. I even watched Lakers versus Magic the other night. The Magic lost by three. And, oh, man, yeah. man, the Magic cared. Like, Suggs, I mean, props to him. People are clowning him on Twitter and, and otherwise. But I loved how ticked off he got that he missed that shot. I loved how angry he was through the fourth quarter that he really cared. So there have been, I mean, and, and that's one of the minor games. There have been a lot of other great performances too. So let's just trade off. You know, we each have a couple things written out here. Um, 
I guess if you want to lead us off, Justin, with just any any surprise that you like. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's a compliment to you. You're calling it with Steph Curry. He is on fire. Ah, um, thank you. If he stays, <laughs> <laughs> if he stays healthy, I mean, look, he's one of my favorite players in the NBA, if not number one. I mean, he's undeniable. And as long as the Warriors, I, I would say, if they just get the top four seed and this number stick like this, I think it's going to be hard pressed to just take him out. I mean, he's averaging 33.5 points a game, um, 56, 47, and 92 on shooting splits. I mean, that is just unbelievable. And it proves he's the greatest shooter of all time. I don't want to hear he's just a great three-point shooter or just like all these technicalities. He is the greatest shooter who ever lived. There's, it's, I don't think, I don't think it's close in terms of the, what type of shots this guy can hit. He is the best. Um, and so we'll see. I'm, you know, injuries, um, slumps, that's always a factor. The Warriors, if they just go on a skid, that could hurt them. But so far, so good. So you're looking really good on that um, prediction, man. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I think they need like um, they need a big moment to come up in the season that uh, that gets people hyped and talking more about Curry, since people expect him to be great, but. No, I, I appreciate the pat on the back, man. We'll we'll see how it pans out. Jokic, I mean, looks incredible for the Nuggets. That, that's not my surprise here. I'll, I'll start with um, a little bit more of a negative note, but I, I'm surprised about the Cleveland Cavaliers stumbling out of the gates. You know, and um, even Evan Mobley was saying before their game with. The Knicks, I believe it was last night, just how this is a big deal. This is a revenge game. We're taking this seriously. Then they drop it to the Knicks. They start the season one and three tied for worst in the Eastern Conference. Now, it's early. This is not like the two and ten Lakers start from last year. That, you know, they really had to dig themselves a hole out of. But, you know, I I could imagine the pressure starting to get turned up, especially if this is as many predict, you know, Donovan Mitchell's last year with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, got to make something happen. Got to take advantage of it while he's here. So that's my first surprise is just didn't, didn't really expect that underperformance. So no, what no. you got next? No, that makes sense. I mean, and it's still early too. I always say, let's see how the first 15 games play out. So it's still early. So it's, there's time to turn it around. So we'll see. Um, my second one, it's not, uh, anything extensive a lot of the top teams are performing a lot of te- teams that we predicted for the most part they're either 500 or they're better so i mean really besides the cavaliers we haven't really seen too many teams that are like taken to say horrible dip yet um so that's been a little bit of a surprise because usually there's a lot of panic <laughs> normally there's usually one or two teams or maybe even more than that that they go through a huge skid and that the panic buttons usually hit. So um, I think it just tells you that a lot of teams are, you know, starting to be informed. And it'll be interesting too, because the end season tournament is happening within a couple of days of this recording of this podcast. So that's a little bit unusual compared to previous seasons where I think build teams can kind of take it easy. You got this new tournament that's taking place. So I think that's rather interesting. Yeah. I'd be curious to see how, how much the players care about the tournament, if that cash bonus is going to be a good incentive, like things, things like that. But yeah, no, it's, it's great. We have this first sort of uh, milestone in the season, even ahead of Christmas. So uh, my next surprise again, I don't know, man, I guess, you know, I do have one positive surprise. So, so I'll just get my downer ones out of the way. You know, we, we record this prediction podcast and I, I make, I don't know, maybe the foolish claim that, hey, the Grizzlies are going to be all right. They're still they're still going to be in the mix in the Western Conference. Doesn't look like it's so far. 0-4 start to this season. We'll see where they are. But, you know, if if I had to defend myself, Stephen Adams was not injured or it was unknown that he was going to be missing um, a good chunk of time here at the start of the season. So, um Yikes. I don't know, Grizzlies. I, I'm, I am getting worried for you. It, I don't know that you can recover without John Morant this time as you have been able to. And like I was confident that you would in the past. It's, it's a little bit tough right now. We'll see yeah. if they bounce back. It's concerning for sure. Yep. Yep. All right. Give me your last surprise and then I'll give you mine. Yeah. Last surprise is Zion Williamson. He is looking really good. 
I think the points, it's less than his career average, but when I'm looking at his minutes per game, it's around 30 minutes per game. That is really impressive. Now, you might be asking, like, well, other guys play way more minutes, but for Zion and his production, consistency is the key. And I think if he can keep this up relative to MLK Day, to the All-Star break, if, to my recollection, a first half of the season where he is not hurt, where he is playing consistently, I think could be a turning point for his career. So I'm just hope crossing my fingers that he doesn't get hurt. But again, I just, it's, it's, it's do or die. Either he can make it happen. If he stays healthy, he's easily an all-star. If he gets hurt, I don't know what, what happens with his future from here. So this is really a, a big time um, stretch for him, but so far so good. 22 points. Um, about 5.7 boards per game. Um, it's it's looking good. He's had a couple of like huge dunks, um, huge highlights. So everything's looking good so far. So I'm just like crossing my fingers that things stay the course with him. Yeah, absolutely. No, this this is a good pick, and the Pelicans are relevant if yeah. if he's out there on the court like this. Mm-hmm. This this changes very much like our prediction about where the Pelicans were going to be if they can keep this up. Now, granted, they're just two and one right now, three games played. It's early, it's early but yeah. uh, you're right. If if he can be out there, this is going to be a huge story. And yeah, I, I like your take. I think a pivotal moment in his career too. Yeah, uh, because this is the season where it's like, is he still going to be a pelican or not? Yeah, as well. Um, now, my last one. I, I did want to end on a high note. And Pat, both you and I on the back, and, and you know, let's let's be fair. A lot of the NBA community too, but we said on the show that we like our chances of Tyrese Halliburton being a household name potentially by the end of this season if the Pacers make some noise. And so far, the numbers have been great. He's been 20-plus points a game and double-digit assists. It's been awesome to see, and the Pacers are really interesting, and they're playing pretty well too. So he's Tyrese Halliballer at the moment, (laughs) I say. And uh, we'll see if that positive momentum can continue. And Indiana, I – they're one of those teams where, you know, I usually have found myself rooting against that team, like yeah. when they were against the Bulls in, in the 90s and things like that. But they're also a team that I kind of secretly deep down like a lot as well. One of those teams where it's it's fun when they're good, like the field house in Indiana and, and the fans get really crazy into it. So I, I like seeing that NBA community, you know, Hoosiers and all that. Um, I like to see them excited friend of the show, Corey Waldron as well, uh, yeah. always talking about the Pacers. So so I, I hope they make some noise here. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and always it's a great basketball tradition, great fan base. Um, speaking of Indiana, um, if you want to shift gears a little bit, um, I think we'd be remiss to not mention the passing of Bob Knight that this happened um, just within an hour ago. I don't oh, know my goodness. I that. didn't even hear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all over Twitter. Um, the mm. Sotis, uh thoughts regarding that just one of the you know very controversial but you can't deny one of the most influential uh, members of the basketball community ever I mean. yeah rest in peace Bob Knight I mean yeah. his his fingerprints are on the game of basketball yep. um, I mean he he was the coach of Isaiah Thomas yeah. uh, and and a lot of other great teams too so yep. uh, thank you for for bringing that up yeah sorry to be a downer um, <laughs> no 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 I mean that's that's a basketball legend right there yeah um, any other items to get to before we wrap up Justin no that's it as always um, check out our archives great interviews great season previews of the Houston Rockets Sacramento Kings. We got a lot of interviews on deck with authors, insiders. As always, we're um, always going hard <laughs> during the first uh, part of the season here, just bringing you the best insiders who are covering the game, um, just to bring you the best coverage that you're not going to see anywhere else. Absolutely. Yep. Stay tuned. It's going to be a great season to follow along with, and we look forward to bringing you lots more episodes like this, along with those great interviews that Justin mentioned. For Justin Goodrum, I'm Matt Thomas. Take care. Peace out. See you next time.